So good morning or good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar titled The Goldilocks Approach, How to Offer Consumer Financing That's Just Right. My name is Melisande de Mouval, publisher of the papers, and I'm delighted to be the co-host of today's session with our partner, Givity. Thank you so much for tuning in, and it's great to see so many of you listening in today. Before I hand over to today's moderator, Ari Korman, head of alliances at Givity, I'd like to share a few quick housekeeping notes. The discussion will take approximately 45 minutes and we will have 10 to 15 minutes for a Q&A at the end of the webinar. On the right side of your screen, you can see the chat panel, which includes a chat room and a Q&A widget. You can ask questions at any time through the discussion. We will compile your questions and the speakers will take as much as possible at the end of the discussion. We also have subtitles available for this webinar. You can activate them by clicking on the CC icon located on the top right hand side of the webinar room to the left side of the chat tab. The subtitles are available in English, Spanish, Italian, German, French and Portuguese. After enabling the subtitles, please allow a few seconds for them to appear in your selected language. If you would like to see a visual guide on how to use the subtitle function, please check out in the handout section. So. Now I will hand it over to Ari Korman. Ari, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And again, welcome everyone to today's webinar. Uh, and a huge thank you to the team at The Papers for hosting this event. And thank you as well to our excellent panelists who we'll get to meet in just a few moments, Dennis, Philip, and Yaakov. And sincere thanks to each and every one of you for attending today. So why don't we start with just a quick word about the larger landscape uh, that we're in. Uh, the worlds of embedded lending and embedded finance uh, are growing rapidly. According to many industry analysts, there are nearly 400 million buy now, pay later or BNPL customers globally, a number expected to reach a billion by 2027 and a market size expected to grow to 3.2 trillion by 2030. Uh, while the exact definition of BNPL and embedded lending are also changing, uh, so are the way that lenders, merchants, and customers uh, continuing to demand more responsible uh, product offerings with a redefinition redefin of these terms. But with all this growth, I think it's important today in, in, in our webinar that we take a step back uh, and we look beyond the numbers, dig deeper, and identify some of the key considerations for lenders and banks and merchants when deciding to embark on new lending programs at point of sale because the program can only be successful if it addresses the very particular needs of customers, real people, uh, and can meet customers where they are in a comfortable, transparent, and frictionless manner. Uh, and this is the focus of today's discussion around offering consumer financing that's just right. Uh, we're gonna hear some best practices from our panelists um, who have tons of experience, uh, each in their own way of delivering customized finance, financial programs to customers and that and programs that customers demand. And so with that, uh, I'm honored to introduce you today's, to today's panelists who will discuss the perfect porridge. Sorry, I had to throw there in uh, at least a reference to Goldilocks. Um, first, I'd like you to meet Philip Siebert. Philip is the head of commercial development and country manager at Econo Bank. Um, Econo is a leading bank in the consumer finance space based in Sweden with offices across Europe uh, offering a wide range of financing and lending products through retailers and brands like Ikea, Audi, Lindex, Shell, and many, many, many more. I'd like to, to also meet Dennis Folk McNulty, the Lord of the Payments, for those that have checked out his LinkedIn profile, and Director of Payment Solutions at Dr. Smile. Uh, Dr. Smile is the market leader in the field of tooth straightening, uh, or for those dentists out there, modern aligner therapy counting more than 150,000 smiling customers and 250 partner practices across Germany and 10 other European countries. And finally, Yaakov Martin, co-founder and CEO at Jiffity. Founded in 2011, Jiffity is a leading financial technology company, bridging the gap between lenders, merchants, and consumers worldwide. The company's platform enables lenders to deploy competitive consumer loan programs at any merchant point of sale. So let's dive in. Um, Dennis, Philip, Yaakov, 
would love to hear from each of you uh, your own experiences with uh, embed, the world of embedded lending. What have Akano, Dr. Smile, Jiffy uh, currently doing in this space? So, uh, Phil, um, I can go ahead and you... jump in there. So for Dr. Smile, as you as you explained, so this is going to be the aligners and it's the complete experience to get this. And obviously aligners are not uh, cheap. They're going to be, let's say, average in Europe, maybe around 3,000 for the entire treatment this is going to the doctor's office getting the aligners and the treatment thereafter and let's say for paying for this most of our customers probably 98 percent would like to do some kind of financing now what does financing look like for each of the countries this is going to be quite different um, i would say that there's not one lender that can do everything and be great in all countries and so what's important for us is actually to have a mixture. And so that's kind of where I'm stepping in and Dr. Smile, how do we find this right mixture? How do we integrate with all of them um, so that we can ultimately provide the best financing for our consumers, but then also be cognizant of the fees um, and the responsibilities that we have at Dr. Smile. Great, thank yeah, you. Yeah, maybe Dennis. continue. Uh, we, 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 we are here at uh, Econombank, actually, we, we have a long tradition in POS financing. You know, therefore, we work across multiple verticals with a strong uh, 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 part in, in uh, furniture financing. And like Dennis already said, you know, you need to find the right way how to en um, enable consumer finance instantly at the point of sale. Yeah, and over the years, uh, and now uh, we, we found out that we need to have more or less consistent customer journeys if you're online, if you're offline, you know, if you're in uh, different countries and regions, and that actually opens the, the necessity to find new, way, new ways of uh, presenting this and, and engage with uh, multiple players in, in, in the markets to make that happen. Yeah. Um... At Jiffy, actually, our uh, experience is quite broad. Uh, to in a sense, we are a facilitator. We uh, work both with uh, the lenders and the banks, uh, banking partners that we have, as well as, of course, merchants and service providers on the other side, and ultimately serving both uh, consumers and small businesses. And the objective of matching the right program, the right institution, with the right type of merchant, service provider, and then ultimately consumer small business has been uh, nothing short of fascinating. Uh, it obviously varies tremendously depending on the vertical, on the market, the loan product, and the objective of making sure that we are showing up or that we are helping the various parties show up when and where most relevant with the most relevant product. And at the same time, obviously, ensuring that it is a responsible product, that it's not putting out consumers Dennis, as you mentioned, and, and small businesses may be into uh, a situation that is not necessarily healthy for them, I think uh, has been uh, fascinating to us. Uh, like I said, varied and definitely not a one size fits all. Yeah, and it, it's interesting to note, right, that I think uh, Philip and, and Dennis in uh, preparing for today's webinar, uh, that you have kind of different experiences uh, in Philip you know, working in this space now, POS, uh, for, for many years, uh, and Dennis, and looking to kind of introduce embedded lending, really based on your act, your direct uh, customer demand. So it'd be interesting to hear a little bit more in kind of your your background now and taking it kind of a step back. So, Philip, you know, when when were you first exposed to the, the concept of embedded lending or, you know, uh, what was the uh, impetus uh, for that? And then Dennis, love to hear as well, uh, yeah. for, from you in maybe a more recent uh, exposure based on your, your customer uh, demands. Yeah, thanks, Ari. Yeah, as you say, you know, you said it in, in the introduction, the, the, the term embedded lending changes uh, over time. Therefore, you know, if we, if we look back to, in the days, you know, for us, a, a customer driven organization, especially in the, in the furniture area, you know, it was important that we actually fulfill, fulfill the needs of the customers at POS at the point of time straight away. Yeah, therefore, you cannot take a lot of paperwork with you. And therefore, I think we, we introduced the kind of first digital lending processes, I think, almost 20 years ago um, in, in, uh, in IKEA. And, and um, that uh, matured, for sure. And, and we saw more channels coming uh, in, and especially more products coming in. We come back most likely to that later. And, and then we needed to find a way to have a consistent journey also online. You know, and that uh, that was more or less the, the, the thing where we where we changed our approach to embedded lending because we said it doesn't really 
uh, help to be uh, to call out to different systems to then uh, uh, introduce the application um, in, 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 in a different way, you know, and therefore we, we were looking and we started, I think, the, the journey in the UK to really have an integrated checkout process um, and that we now are looking to for multi other markets and other merchants and you know that is basically the way how we want to display this going forward and actually we want to have a consistent uh, customer centric uh, journey going forward that is basically unilateral in each market that we are operating in. yeah and um, yeah from my side my a lot of my experience is behind e-commerce and marketplace so what does the checkout page look like? What are we offering to our customers? How easy is it for them to do things? This has always uh, been the, the main focus of mine. And when we talk about embedded consumer financing, I can tell you this, uh, this is a space that's a bit underrepresented. So if you think of any PSP that's out there, of course, you're going to get your single payments, your card, your APMs, you're going to get your some buy now pay laters, but where's the consumer lending there? And so how are you integrating this into your checkout page? So I can tell you from recent experience with Dr. Smile, I can honestly say that I wouldn't say that our customers are all smiling right now because the consumer lending part is not so easy. It is not embedded into our checkout process yet. We are working on this. Um, and so what that means, it's it's the disjunct um, in experience. So Dr. Smile, we're all about the experience. So we uh, we want to handhold uh, somebody who wants to have a great smile. We set up the appointments for you. We we get you excited about things. And then when it comes time to payments, if you want financing, we're like, okay, great. And then we just throw you off somewhere to some lender that we have for your country. It shouldn't be like that. In this day and age where everything is API driven, we can embed this into our checkout. So it's all seamless. And then they get a list of approved uh, lenders for their country that match them. And so this is ultimately where we want to go. It's interesting, Dennis, that you uh, that you say that, uh, because if if our uh, attendees check out your website, you'll see that financing is really all over the, the uh, Dr. Smile experience. And you're very transparent as well in, in, in the three different, at least as far as I could tell, the th minimum three different uh, plans that you offer with the interest rates, with the terms, with the monthly payments, et cetera. So it's it's surprising, honestly, to hear that uh, the customers uh, are then surprised at the very end that the uh, financing experience is a manual one or not a transparent one. I, I actually have the opposite uh, impression in checking out the site um, myself. So I guess you're doing good marketing um, and we'll, We'll get to the uh, as we as we progress with questions and discussions. We'll uh, we'll we'll try to uncover a little bit more uh, what you're currently doing and what uh, what your ambitions are um, for the future. Um, you both mentioned uh, Philip and Dennis the concept of a checkout or integrated checkout. I think it's a great place to bring in Yakov as well from uh, from his experience in uh, managing or Jiffy managing these types of uh, these types of projects and what that actually means in terms of checkout. Um, uh, Yaakov, maybe be interesting to hear your take on, on that concept of integrated checkout, uh, showing the different payment methods as well as the uh, specific financing methods. Sure. It, it takes me a little bit back to the evolutionary process, even here at Jiffity, that we have undergone. Um, but it really does tie into some of the introductions that we heard here from uh, both you, Philip, and, and from Dennis, from two, so to speak, opposite sides of the experience, right? I mean, if you think about uh, traditional banks and financial institutions, their bread and butter is essentially underwriting, credit in different forms, different products, different audiences, different clients. Uh, and, and some financial institutions obviously have a record of, of decades, sometimes even centuries of, uh, of experience, regulation, of course, their ability to structure it properly, um, manage their risk, their cost of capital is efficient. And I think that what we have seen with many of our partners is that it becomes very, very difficult for a bank or financial institution in a scalable manner to make these offerings accessible. And why is that? Be, and especially today, because of the speed that all of these environments are moving at. So if once upon a time, the objective of a bank or a lender or financial institution was to bring the customer into the four walls of the bank, meet a banker, sit down, fill out the paperwork, that, that worked. But the moment the expectation is for the essentially core banking product to be offered outside of those four walls, 
both in physical and digital environments, it becomes very, very difficult, varied, and so on. If we think on the other side, uh, Dennis, about what you care about, like you said, is a seamless experience. Now, what we are actually looking for the bank to do is to integrate or make their product offering available both at the point of application. Where does it show up? When does it show up? How seamless is it? Can it show up in a multifaceted manner where it's offering varied products or within a brick and mortar type of setting, a clinic, online, et cetera? And then to the payments piece that both you, Ari, and Dennis, you both refer to, it doesn't end there. Even if you are successful building all of that out, now you need to make sure that this loan is funded in a way that the merchant or service provider knows how to kind of accept that payment. If you're introducing a whole new payment method, that's something to take into account. It can be quite a taxing uh, task to, to integrate that and make sure that treasury works properly, reconciliation works properly, and it's, it interrupts the business as usual. So there are many, many different components as, as um, taken for granted as it may seem that in this day and age, these type of, of financial products should be offered at checkout seamlessly behind the scenes. There are many different components to take care of. And I'll just add. And then it's I'll... a great point, uh, Yaakov, there in terms, of, and I'd love to hear as we just continue this discussion from Philip's standpoint of, of standing up the new programs, that it's not only the checkout, but it's actually making sure that this new type of loan product is then reflected on the back end, everything from, as you mentioned, settlement, but then to the, ultimately creating that loan on the back end and how the bank then manages and services uh, that loan. But uh, I think it's a great it's a great point that people don't necessarily think of and in, in, okay, how do we actually create this loan um, as the bank? But I think Yaakov, you wanted to say a second point as well there. I'll just, I'll just end off and say, Yes, obviously, there are all these components that, uh, uh, again, are not always visible uh, to the naked eye and taking place or need to take place behind the scenes. And when 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 you add on top of that the requirement of these uh, products where they have to fit the vertical, the product, the audience, um, you've all of a sudden, a sudden layered another uh, layer of complexity that definitely requires uh, expertise it requires sometimes even a certain degree of planning and patience in order to really arrive at that silver bullet that uh, caters to all of the needs of all of the parties sitting around this virtual table. Great, thank you, uh, thank you, Yaakov. So we're seeing uh, some great questions come through. Just a reminder to post any questions you have, don't be shy uh, in the chat. And we will get to them as we can uh, and as they fit into the, uh, the flow of the conversation. Uh, and then we'll leave, as, uh, as we said in the beginning, the last 15 minutes or so to, to go through any remaining questions uh, as well. So I think uh, it'd be interesting to share. Um, re I read recently a report uh, from the uh, venture capital firm, the Viola Group. It's a leading VC um, investing in, in different types of technology companies. And the report is called, uh, it depends on the context, from embedded to contextual finance. And I'm just going to quote two, three sentences from the report. It's about eight or 10 pages long, uh, which really ties into this topic. And I think it's a good springboard for the next uh, set of questions. So um, contextual finance can be best understood through the lens of intent. Often purchasing a financial product is not the main objective of the customer but rather a secondary outcome that arises from another goal. For instance, someone doesn't wake up in the morning with a desire to obtain a mortgage, but they do wake up with a desire to buy a home. And this primary intent of purchasing a home is what drives their actions while getting a mortgage, uh, which ends up being complementary intent and helps them achieve their goal. So by considering context uh, and offering a financial product as part of a customer journey toward achieving the customer's primary goal, contextual finance can deliver an embedded, personalized, and on-time experience. Um, so with that in mind around context and around helping customers achieve goals and really moving from a world of split pay, you know, paying three, paying four, uh, smaller transaction value to a world of more uh, 
an expanding to a world of more uh, deliberative purchases, uh, larger purchases, et cetera. Um, I'd love to hear you know, from the panelists, and, and Philip, I think from you first, um, how that is dictated, that kind of going up market or that kind of deliberative uh, mindset, how, how that's dictated the types of programs that Econo uh, has launched uh, and the types of industry uh, verticals where Econo is currently uh, present. Yeah. No, I really like that quote because actually we tried to say, you know, the customer want to afford a sofa and he don't want to uh, apply for a credit card or a credit or loan or whatever. And I think that is that is actually where we are coming from. You know, therefore, the, in, in at first place, uh, actually, and I, I think it really uh, doesn't um, depend on the vertical. You know, actually, it's basically to fulfill uh, a, a contextual dream or whatever, a wish of the customer with a consumer finance product. You know, and then you know this is actually where 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 the journey starts, and and then the question is, and that is quite interesting in the context on which product to offer is how, what do we want to do with it? Therefore, if the the, the merchant is really only inter interested in in doing and facilitating a purchase, then split pay and and the classical now to be regulated by no pay later products facilitate that quite good. But if you are uh, intending to give the customer a little bit more over a loyalty element, you know, and to, to, to expand the, the relationship over a customer life cycle and, and also activate the customer for recurring purchases, then you need to have other tools to re-engage with the customer. And I think that is what, what we actually uh, do with uh, quite a big card-based uh, lending with, with multiple option and combined with uh, loyalty programs. And I think if you, if you have a, a loyal customer base, which most of our merchants that we engage with have, yeah, then that's the right thing to do. And then the transactionals, you need to facilitate as well. But I think, you know, last year actually we included a kind of regulated buy now, pay later into a credit card uh, in our German business where you then actually can move transactions into into certain buckets and then actually have the same um, uh, functionality like you would have with a, one of the particular buy now, pay later product, but it's in a in a um, responsible lending sphere. Yeah. What therefore. type of product? Uh, Phil, what type of product was that? Uh, was that a co-branded right. card? Or? That that's a co-branded credit card. Yeah, with okay. with multiple uh, functionalities and um, you know um, and that works extremely well and customers appreciate that. Yeah, um, and and um, then you can actually move transactions into into zero percent buckets. But that's just one example. Okay. Yeah, therefore I think it's it's really about. Uh, establishing uh, the, the customer life cycle with the customer and most customers actually in the moment when they apply for a loan uh, and thinking about paying for a sofa, they don't even know what opportunities they got with uh, embedded finance products that they can use then and activate afterwards. So, so you do things as well like lower APR for uh, the, the merchant's customers, for example, I mean, if, assuming it's like an open loop type card? Yeah, for sure, we, we do things like this, but uh, right. also we can we can actually also convert the credit card transactions on the product into installment loans and stuff uh, at zero percent financing. And therefore, it's it's basically to give the customer more or less all the options in one product instead of actually uh, 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 reassigning or reapplying for for a new product all the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Dennis, I'd love to hear as well as Philip uh, used some of the uh, some of the buzzwords around relationships and life cycle, um, how you know this this concept of contextual finance and uh, meeting customers where they are has changed basically within Doctor Smile since uh, since you've been there the last few years. Exactly. It's it's. I'm glad you mentioned loyalty because you might think with an aligner business, well, surely after the treatment, everything is done, but it's actually not true because we're with you in the entire treatment. So let's say that you're in a treatment for one year uh, and then after that you want teeth whitening or other dental services. There are other things that we have. And so we like to cross sell these during or maybe after, and we do like to reward people. So let's say that um, if they did financing, if they would like to add to their loan, we are trying different programs there or maybe we offer interest free because in the end if a customer gets interest free we are paying for this in the end and so it's it's kind of like a discount something nice to have if you decide to get teeth whitening after your experience for example so this is definitely something that's very important for us as well and i would assume you you cater to a, a younger demographic uh in general who may not have 
experience with financing, or this may even be one of their first experiences. And, and also, you know, based on the reports that we all read regarding uh, average number of credit cards for the younger demographic. So they come with a different intent, I guess, as well, or maybe an expectation around financing uh, rather than coming, you know, already with a credit card. Is that kind of what you see as well? It's completely relevant for us. I would say that, um, for example, one of our major marketing um, areas is TikTok. And so from TikTok, we are getting 18 year olds, 20 year olds. And I can admit when I was 18, I don't think I fully understand what it meant to actually get a loan. I didn't really need to at the time. And so this goes back to this having a nice, easy to understand, intuitive Dr. Smile experience. So if, if I just sent you to a lending provider and said, hey, send up your financing here, here's the invoice, an 18-year-old would have problems with this. Um, also, it could be the fact that maybe they do a credit check on the 18-year-old, but maybe the parents are going to pay for this. And then this adds more complexity. So this is stuff that we would like to bring in-house, wide label solution to really help the customers, no matter what their demographics is. And we want to be able to, per country, go for each demographic and make things easier. Great. And just uh, one last question as we're on this topic of contextual uh, and value. Uh, Yaakov, I, it would be great to hear maybe one really you know, success story or experience that stands out in uh, one of the programs that, uh, that the team at Jiffity has run uh, around meeting a real customer need uh, or a deliberative type purchase where you know, it felt like you were really kind of going into, uh, into you know, helping customers, providing customers or enabling lenders to offer uh, financing to customers that were looking to make uh, like a deliberative purchase or a life-changing type uh, or meaningful purchase. Right. So, so I think that actually ties right back to some of the uh, stats or reports that you mentioned before, Ari, and that both of you have commented on. Um, and again, ties to kind of the general topic of a, a not being a one-size-fits-all. So when we, we think about the con contextual uh, finance there are two elements that really stood out to us over the years and I think helped us uh, with some of these success stories that you mentioned, and that is both timing and placement. So while, Philip, you're absolutely right, I think most human beings don't wake up in the morning with the objective of obtaining a loan for the sake of a loan. Uh, they have some sort of other objective, and sometimes that need arises. However, to simplify things, even if we consider the difference between a very large ticket item, a renovation, a very complex and expensive medical procedure, as opposed to a much smaller ticket item, the relevance or timing for finance is obviously completely different. When, when a, uh, an individual, let's say, is considering a home renovation, finance surfaces usually pretty early on in the process, sometimes almost as a starting point or a determining factor. And therefore, in projects where we were involved, we needed to do everything possible to make sure that this option surfaces in a very clear way. Dennis, as you pointed out, I mean, uh, uh, renovations are sometimes maybe later on in life, but not as late as um, uh, maybe you would expect in terms of having the full appreciation for the financial uh, world and inner workings. And therefore, you need to make sure that it surfaces very early on, as opposed to a much smaller ticket item where financing may be an alternative, but just as a nice to have. You do not want to bombard them with all of that uh, at the very beginning of the process. On the other hand, you may not want to wait all the way for the checkout page and all of a sudden spring it on them when they've already taken out their credit card. So really figuring out the timing and the way that it's presented is absolutely key. And here too, depending on the environment that we're in, we have done different things that worked out uh, to be extremely interesting, meaning the, the brick and mortar environment as opposed to the online. With the online, on the one hand, you have the ability of tracking, so to speak, where in the journey the customer is at and through widgets that we've launched and so on and so forth, made sure that sometimes it's just on the side, it's not front and center, so they know that they have that alternative, but where it's more critical to them completing the journey, making sure that it surfaces in a more primary manner. Uh, maybe one last example where I really did feel that this was a bit of a, uh, uh, a transformation. Um, take, without mentioning names, take uh, large brick and mortar stores with customer journeys, where um, in the past, 
you one would have to go through the entire customer journey and then sign up uh, or line up and hopefully see the option of finance, wait to actually ask for it to be offered, divulge their uh, personal details only to possibly be declined and take a walk of shame because they couldn't afford what they put in their cart. And that was obviously a terrible experience. And according to many of our partners, they estimated that about 30% of the eligible or, or relevant applicants would not apply for the fear of decline, uh, as well as the integration that it required in terms of the, the store systems. We were able to reverse that all and ensure that the option for finance in one way or another, according to the guidelines that I mentioned before, surfaced much earlier on in the journey. And we gave customers the ability to apply in privacy through their own mobile device. And if approved to receive already the payment method that was no different to the payment method being used by other customers. So there is no embarrassment or, 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 or shame or other considerations involved. Actually, let me just quickly piggyback off of that uh, because Jakob, that's a super good point for us. That's something that's also something we'd like to improve because we have the journey uh, even before you have a treatment plan for your teeth. So the first time you go to the dental appointment, we want to give uh, customers the option to see what financing might look like and just talk about it. Because at this point, because they've gone to the dental clinic, we have a lot of the information. They can also enter it themselves. And so they can say, OK, if I actually were to do this, then I think I would be approved for this 12 month loan. So this whole pre-approval process that customers are able to go through before to educate and not have the walk of shame and not be not smiling at the end is something that's uh, super important for us as well. Yeah, and I think, so I'd like to just uh, now share a few questions that have been coming in. Uh, Dennis, I have two, two questions. I think they're related. So I'm just gonna um, kind of group them together. So we have one, thank you, Torsten, um, who's interested to know um, if the financing that you're offering um, isn't it correct that financing cannot be offered by doctors in Germany, but only by medical clearing houses uh, or exactly. uh, factoring companies? Or so maybe if you could speak speak to that. And uh, the other question we have here from Joe is regarding the payment side. Um, so, do you have any partnerships or experiences with other uh, payment companies that you could also offer financing um, as well? So, just two questions. If you could address those two, uh, Dennis. Exactly. So for the first one about where, uh, who can be financing? Yes, actually, I can say for all the countries we're in, they all have different regulations. And so, yes, for Germany, and of course, let's say for our case, we have multiple entities, a medical entity, a e-commerce entity, these kind of things. And we have to work uh, with different factoring providers, uh, for example, in Germany. But in Spain, this is different. In Sweden, this is different. And this um, actually goes to the point of we need to have an inventory of different factoring providers, different lenders for every country. And this is why also I didn't really talk about this, but with the Jiffity uh, or other solutions that are like that, orchestrating this whole process. And um, so that's really important because we can integrate with 20 different uh, lenders and factoring providers out there. Um, but yes, we do have to be very cognizant of, of how we do lending for each of the countries. Um, and this kind of ties to the next question. So payment providers, yes. So also this is important for us because not everybody wants to do financing. There are people that would like to use their credit card because let's say it's credit card. You will have an open credit line with your bank that you're paying whatever intervals. That's fine. You want to get your Amex points? That's okay with me. So these, we just want to make sure that we have everything buy now, pay later. And also in this form, I am more a fan of orchestration again. So an orchestrator that is able to bring the payment solutions and the financing solutions so that we can do everything API, white label it, Dr. Smile, and then everybody's happy. Great, thank you. And uh, Philip, curious as well, um, as we discussed kind of industry verticals and uh, we discussed you know, obviously the dental, uh, curious if there are any specific verticals that you have found, I know we, we mentioned a few in the beginning, but. Are there any other verticals that you have found to be, let's say, challenging or uh, that the bank initially launched and maybe saw some initial success, but decided to pull back? Just curious in, in terms of like how you have looked at the different verticals and you know, marrying your offering to, to customer demand. 
Yeah, I, in, uh, basically, you know, we, we the verticals that we are in usually actually we se select quite carefully. Therefore, and it's 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 based on we are quite value driven business. You know, therefore, you know, it needs to be really a, a need there for the customer. It's not just because of uh, lending out more and more money uh, to people. It needs to be for a purpose and to to fulfill the uh, affordability needs uh, uh, with the customers. And, and you know, you, you, you see, usually we work with quite uh, big uh, companies, as you know, on, on, on uh, uh, multiple markets. But maybe one example, actually, years ago, we actually launched a, a, a product for, for stationary um, opticians and hearing aid providers, you know, where, where actually they had a, a particular need and, and then they could actually uh, grant the, the, the financing on the shop floor at the point of time. And that helped them quite a lot. And they re-engaged and coming back to the loyalty aspect why we did it, you know, I think for the for those customers, they return, for example, for new glasses every other year. And therefore, it's a tiny business. We like it. It's not it's not the biggest one that we have. But I think that is where you can can find uh, verticals which you don't expect to add value. That's and interesting. I think that, that, that's that, and that's an older that's an older population as well. So uh, just yeah. curious, kind of my gut question there is, uh, how did you offer that uh, to to I guess an older population, maybe not as tech tech oriented? Was it? Uh, like sales assisted, or what? What was the yeah. mechanism that you actually used to, uh, to to make those aware, basically, that they had financing options? Yeah, no, and therefore it's not for this uh, audience here uh, that interesting today because it's a really old embedded financing solution that's uh, assisted in the store. You know, there are some some elements that that we that we have basically put online to an app like identification to make it easier for the store, uh, actually store clerk to, to, to handle it. But it's just it's it's just a, a story about, you know, how uh, on the verticals. Yeah, therefore, I could uh, talk about other verticals which are way, way bigger. And, and yeah, don't be hard on yourself. Don't, don't be hard on yourself. Though. We have okay. uh, I know from from my own experience, uh, some so, some, uh, you know, models where when it comes to larger ticket uh, ticket products and servicing around uh, spaces like agriculture uh, yeah. and retail, there can also be uh, you know uh, sales assisted flows as well. So it's yeah. it's very much still a, a large practice that, uh, that that exists in the market. So and therefore we we are here for the many, yeah. And therefore you know we we need to find solutions for the many as well. And if you if you then look into verticals like like you asked, where it's basically not that interesting or where we where we see uh, in the past what we what we tried out uh, it's for example things like petrol stations you know that uh, and 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 all this this segment where you have actually consumable goods i think that that's from from several angles i think it's not a, a, a it's not a perfect environment to create long lasting uh, besides credit cards yeah long lasting relationships you know and therefore this is this is a little bit what we uh, we, we are still uh, doing, but you know, it's not as as uh, um, it's the tickets. The tickets are basically uh, smaller. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'd like to switch gears just for a few minutes um, to the area of regulatory. This is the kind of topic that no marketing evangelist would ever pick uh, to be the title of a webinar, and maybe there aren't enough webinars around it. But I think, given the fact that uh, both Philip and Dennis and and Yaakov uh, are running programs across many, many different countries. The topic of uh, regulation and compliance is interesting. Uh, also, shout out to all the compliance officers out there that uh, do the hard work uh, uh, every day. So in the context of uh, where you guys are located in the EU, um, I think many know that the EU adopted an updated, uh, more stringent directive last October designed to address some gaps in uh, consumer credit products, uh, also to reflect uh, some technological developments. So. We've been discussing different aspects of uh, consumer lending programs, and it would be very interesting to hear uh, from you know, each of you really how these new regulations that have come in the past and also this one uh, impact how you've gone about building your offerings, right? Knowing kind of that not only will there be EU related directives, but then at the country level, uh, each country will essentially take those directives and uh, transpose them down into the individual uh, country levels. So Dennis, we'd love to hear first from you and then Philip uh, and Yaakov, you know, what, uh, what you've done in terms of taking into account um, the, EU, the EU directives um, and also how that's affected things like marketing, direct, indirect, uh, things like credit checks, um, and then kind of how you manage that at a country level as well. 
Exactly. I think um, I'll start with credit checks because you just mentioned that right now. This is one thing that is a bit challenging because we don't want to only rely on lenders for the credit checks. We also want to do it ourselves because it's not just credit checks, it's open banking and other ways to get customer information so that we can actually customize the checkout page for what we think uh, is going to be best for you instead of, instead of um, setting you up for failure. This is tricky because every country has their own regulations about what consumer data that you can see. Um, I mean, for us, the, the, the best is that we're informed about this. We have a mega great legal team that is on top of all these things. And also for us, for the, the new things coming up, we're very proactive. We're, we're, we're looking at what's coming up. When things start to really uh, finalize and the dust is settling, then we talk to our product teams and we say, okay, how are we going to deal with this? Um, is it a good change? Is it a bad change? Do we need to take things off? And we really look into this and we plan ahead instead of the scramble scene at the end. Um, so yeah, that's that's how we're dealing with this. So you'd say that around kind of data privacy uh, in terms of credit checks, in terms of uh, the checkout experience, uh, marketing, um, any other specific pieces there that, uh, that touch on regulation as you go into different uh, in different markets? Uh, of course, for us, because we're, we are in the medical um, uh, sector, because of this, the interactions that we have with the different dental practices also is okay. up to regulations. For example, for most countries, we will pay for the customer to go to their first appointment in the dental clinic. However, in France, that's not allowed. And so as things like this change, of course, we have to change our user experience. But really, for us, it's it's just being ready, understanding the regulations. This is hard, uh, making your own interpretation of it and then uh, implementing it. Mm -hmm. and, and Philip, uh, I know that you're a lawyer uh, in a previous life, I guess, uh, Yaakov as well. We have that in common. Uh, Philip, as, as someone that's kind of doing these programs in different countries, also, there's a fair amount of I assume, resources and costs that goes into uh, to making sure that systems, making sure that marketing, et cetera, uh, go. And so just curious, I know that we only have a few minutes before we go into the Q&A, but we'd love to hear how you tackle this area of uh, an ever-changing regulatory landscape. Yeah, I think the last uh, last sentence put it out quite well. Therefore, it's a never-ending story. Therefore, for sure, we, we do this for, for multiple years in multiple markets. And therefore, we established models, actually, that we start from the regulation, uh, you know, the pure text. And then, actually, we work with the local adaptions. And then, then uh, we look into how we actually make it as comparable uh, as, as, as possible. Yeah. And, and there might be all differences like you addressed. Therefore, we try to keep the core, the core components actually as, uh, as solid based on regulation as it could. Yeah. But then always, you know, if you talk about identification, for example, uh, data privacy, there's some, some tweaks, you know, for in the Nordics, we are quite privileged having a bank ID and MID for, for KYC in Germany. It's, it's still, uh, uh quite, quite, um, uh, a little bit uh, outdated uh, ways of identifying as phrases like this. Yeah, and therefore, no, for sure, there, there will always be things that we need to adapt, but we, we try to do it from a, from a pan-European approach, therefore to see, okay, where, where, where's the commonalities to, to save actually resources? And then we, we have uh, multinational teams to, to put the, uh, to point out the, the, the variances and then we implement them locally for sure. That's, that's the game. Yeah. Okay, and Jakob, I know that uh, you know as Jiffy uh, launches different types of uh, financial products, uh, you you mentioned split pay. You also mentioned things like traditional term loans or lines of credit. So, how does that? How, how are things like that impacted? Obviously, by you know by by regulatory and also things like pre-approvals, uh, soft credit checks, hard credit checks, etc. How does a technology provider uh, balance all these different things in, uh, in in launching programs for for your customers? Right. So, so I'll start actually from the macro. I mean, first of all, I have to say that uh, generally we actually welcome regulations to a certain degree with open arms. Now, obviously, it's never fun to have to constantly change things up and anticipate and, uh, um, you know, tear open things that you've just completed. But on the other hand, I think we've uh, lived through a bunch of years where we saw what can happen in growing industries or segments when they operate below the radar, where they're not regulated. And, uh, you know, in, in the long term, that's obviously uh, not good for anyone. So in general, this is uh, this is a blessing that the regulator is actually broadening its reach. Um, and I think that it's also curbed the industry a bit. So if once upon a time there was such a focus on uh, quick digital split pay, 
uh, regulation starts coming in and all of a sudden you say this isn't as easy as every, sorry, Tom, Dick and Harry creating a buy not pay later company. Uh, so you have to start considering what is it that you're financing? Is it finance worthy? Um, because you're going to have to invest quite a bit also on the regulatory side. So, so, so that's kind of a general comment about uh, regulation in general. For us, it's definitely actually, um, I would say, even enhanced our business in a way, because I think many of our uh, banking partners and prospects realize that as regulation moves in, they can shine. They have the experience. They're situated uh, in a way where they can offer responsible finance as opposed to uh, some of the fintechs out there who weren't necessarily in the same position when regulation uh, came in. From a technology standpoint, one of the things that we learned very quickly that we had to do if we wanted to truly serve multi-markets, and, and it's quite unusual as a, as a tech provider not to focus on North America or Europe, uh, we really do straddle both and beyond, um, is to build your technology, first of all, well, first of all in a very modular manner. You have to be able to move pieces in and out. Um, and even just the order of the customer journey, as some of you mentioned before, are often impacted by regulation. So you have to build it with the modularity and, of course, have the expertise on the team that understand both the technology, the finance, and the regulation piece. And one last note, I know we're uh, heading towards the, the end of our session, um, is to leverage third parties. Don't try to reinvent the wheel where you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And we have this in our business, a whole orchestration layer where we enable many of our partners to utilize the services of KYC, AML, eSign, whatever exists in the specific market that is truly regulated and vetted already, as opposed to having to uh, uh, reinvent that and spend a lot of time and, and uh, resource on, on that. Great. Thank you, uh, Jakob. So... The last few minutes here, uh, we're going to dive into some some questions. I'm going to uh, picking the best ones, and uh, we'll call you out. So thank you so much. Keep them coming in. For any that we're not able to answer, uh, we'll make sure to to get back to you after the webinar. And happy to follow up. So the, the next question is uh, from Maria. Do you find that different? And I guess this is really for uh, Dennis and for Philip. Uh, do you find that different countries require different types of financing? For example, perhaps German consumers have different preferences to UK consumers in terms of how they want to pay over time. So this would be, I guess, buying patterns uh, by country. And uh, you could, I guess, answer this as well, maybe tying into some of the, as you mentioned, like the, the way that maybe dental practices operate or your partners operate uh, or fill up in, in terms of the different types of merchants that you work with uh, in different countries. So guys, go for it. So I can definitely tell you, yes, <laughs> every country that we have has different financing, um, let's say preferences. So I think the most uh, uh, blatant one is the, the length of term. So we actually offer um, to 72 months when it comes to financing. And if we look at the distribution for each country, they're all over the place. Um, it, it, it really depends on the country. Also, the way in which people would like to finance. Um, for example, in Germany, in general, with uh, how people choose to pay, PayPal is quite large. It's around 35, 40% of people choosing to use PayPal, which is actually great because with PayPal, you can pay once, you can pay over three times, or actually you can do 12 with some countries in Europe. Um, and so I think with the German customers, that works well, whereas in countries like, let's say, Spain, Portugal, of course, we, we're seeing a lot of longer term stretch over time. Um, another huge factor that we see and we've the tested payments is, reflect uh, dinner preferences as well. Exactly, exactly. Okay. And one other thing that we see a lot because we tested this is going to be the interest free term. So do you offer six months interest free, 12 months, 24 months? And let's say the effects that we've had for this are also all over the place. We see countries that if we decrease from 12, uh, 24 months to 12 months interest-free, they don't care, they'll, they'll do 12 uh, because they just did 24 because they could before. Where other countries are, they're saying, no, actually I will pay the interest because I actually did want 24 months. So yes, we definitely see a huge range of preferences there. Great. And Philip, if uh, you could take the same uh, the same question regarding consumer preferences in different uh, different markets, uh, you know, yeah. I know that you have different merchants, but in general, any sort of uh, 
generalities that you could uh, that you see in the different markets that you operate in? For sure, UK is a quite a different market from the Germans. Therefore, it's quite good to take those two. Therefore, the Germans is uh, for, historically it's a classical installment loan country. Therefore, and if you beef that up with a zero percent, they really like that, and they go for it. Yeah, but still, you know, it's evolving. Therefore, you know, we see a lot of things coming in split pace, uh, like you say, uh, Dennis, and all the opportunities. You know, I think it's also a kind of simple accessibility, and I think what Germans are quite appealed by is is names that they know, what they that they find with. Um, in the UK, yeah, you know, it's still you know quite uh, a lot of uh, fast loans revolving. Uh, it's, it's way more present in in the UK, which is then used more frequently. We see the trends in Germany as well emerging, but you know that that is a classical. Um, um, uh, a difference and and also if you look into the customer uh, uh, groups you know in Germany you have a, a, a quite comparably large uh, saving buying community you know they wait and save until uh, they can actually afford something without taking a loan and you have on the on the opposite side you see in other markets ex that people actually um, plan much more with installments uh, um, uh, for, for longer periods and multiple at the same time. Yeah, not to be that we don't have that in Germany as well, but you know, you see a little bit of the, uh, the shift a little bit from that. And the Nordic countries would be similar to Germany in that, uh, Philip? Uh, I think, you know, now they are a little bit, uh, I think that uh, in, in the Nordic, you know, taking uh, financing from multiple groups is quite common as well. Therefore, I think Germany is a little bit behind, but they're catching up. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the next question is uh, from Jean-Marc, and uh, this is for all the panelists, but I guess, uh, Jakob, why don't we have you take this one? Do you think that BNPL will survive the e this new EU regulation, uh, or will it become a regular regulated consumer credit product? Question is from Jean-Marc. Sure. So, so um, I actually would say that this is based on some conversations that we've had with uh, regulators as well. It, it was interesting. Uh, as soon as this started surfacing, we had some of the regulators reach out because they wanted our view, which they consider to be a bit more varied than any single type of provider. Um, I don't believe that the regulator's goal is to equate uh, buy now, pay later to every other type of, of regulated loan. It really will depend, in, in my opinion, ultimately on the parameters. So if it smells like a long-term loan and looks like a long-term loan and is serving the same purposes, then yes, indeed, it will be regulated as the same. But if based on those parameters, there is a clear differentiation, while the regulator is going to look for certain things such as data sharing and reporting, it is not looking to apply all of the stringent rules to those types of, let's call them split pay for the sake of this conversation, um, but, but definitely have more visibility so that we don't end up in situations where, especially maybe younger uh, uh, demographics um, who are not quite, let's say, uh, experienced in what it means to leverage yourself, get into a situation where they've taken 40 different buy now, pay laters from different providers who have no ability to really assess their true risk when such a concentration exists. Great, and let me just piggyback on that question with another question from uh, Hiroko. Uh, and uh, Philip, it'd be great to get your take on this. For emerging countries, where card penetration is low, what kind of data resources or, or, finan or financial options are available in order to make credit decisions? So uh, I'm not sure exactly by emerging countries what Hiroko means, but I assume outside of the countries that we've discussed, uh, so maybe in uh, Latin America, maybe in certain countries in Asia, et cetera. What is your experience there in, in offering these types of products? Yeah, actually, we, as we are not operating there, my, my uh, uh, knowledge is quite limited. On that, but uh, generally, I think uh, to build a credit history is is uh, uh, quite important for more. We saw this in India, especially you know over the years, um, and 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 therefore you know in Europe and in in the US, you know we are quite spoiled kind of you know when it comes to credit data, yeah, and therefore it's quite it's quite easy to get that, and and I assume that's quite hard, and especially the exposures and and also the the, the collection of 
uh, uh, that is, is quite hard in those markets, as I understand. But I can, I have no experience from there how to how to lend. There are other experts that I can answer that better. Yeah, it, it's interesting because um, uh, for those that follow the news, Apple Pay uh, recently announced uh, last month that the Apple Pay Later uh, product is now uh, going to be reported to Experian as one of the main uh, uh, global credit bureaus and then part of credit reporting. So I think that's an interesting trend. It's something that's been surfacing now for many, many years regarding uh, the interface between uh, what was called buy now, pay later or embedded lending uh, and credit and credit reporting, credit bureaus. So um, why don't we just do uh, maybe a final question on that uh, topic in, uh, from, uh, from Celia. Uh, and I guess we'll, we'll find each of the panelists can answer this one. And with that, we will, um, we will sign off. So have you seen consumer financing create new channels for fraud or abuse um, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, are, because this has been a largely unregulated and because it is, uh, there are different types of financing in each country, does this provide, you know, present many gray areas? Um, so, so again, um, just love to hear from each of you, your take on uh, consumer financing and how uh, we can take it into the positive as well, what we can do to prevent uh, fraud and abuse as uh, banks, as merchants, and as technology providers. Uh, so, yeah. uh, Yako, if you want to you, you take that one, and then we'll, uh, Dennis and Philip, and then uh, we'll sign off. Dennis, you were going to say something? Go ahead. Just quickly from my side, so from the merchant point of view, um, the abuse we actually see on the non-payer side, that's something we haven't brought up yet. And let's say this is going to be after they have the loan and let's say if we were the ones taking the risk or actually the banks are also taking the risk sometimes too what happens then and how do we actually prevent this so this is also something that we take a look at so of um defaulted payments we look at what was the customer looking like should we have maybe offered them something that wasn't so long term um and i think the, these are things that we look at to really prevent the abuse that can happen later for non-payers. So that's just one topic in, in within fraud and abuse that's kind of top of mind for us. Sure. Um, one of the things that we definitely have had success with is, like I mentioned before, really uh, giving the access to certain third parties. And there are different third parties that have the expertise and the know-how in the various markets. So having that ability to plug into the right type of providers in, in the right markets, uh, that is one thing that definitely uh, helped us. I, we also are big believers that, or and we've seen this in our data, that um, much of the fraud and the abuse can be attributed to the types of verticals than the types of loans or, or programs being offered. Uh, when they are let's say, no friction whatsoever, easy as can be, nice to have, don't require much effort and so on and so forth. Obviously, you see uh, uh, a spike. And when we are speaking about uh, larger loans that have to be thought through and invested more in, in terms of the actual application, then that in and of itself is a bit of a filter. Obviously, no one can rely only on, on that. And as I mentioned before, that is kind of the direction that we and many of our partners have been going anyway to look for those medium size and larger type of transactions that are meaningful, that are purposeful, that are predetermined. Um, but those those two are definitely uh, interesting things that we've seen develop. Thank you, Yaku. Yeah. So I'm gonna just tackle yeah. that and then yeah, over to Melissa on Keep it short. Now, and therefore, Jaco, exactly spot on. You know, I think it's a very, uh, a, again, a quite dependent on uh, uh, the finance good and the vertical. Yeah, therefore, and that's one element. And the other element, what we see is the more uh, usable a financial services product gets, uh, the more attempts you get. Therefore, I think it's even more important, like I say, that you strengthen your fraud protection environment. And, and I think, um, I think we, we we are doing that quite well. It's it's a mixture of internal and external data, but you need to keep an eye on it. The more flexibility you give, for for example, a credit card is more attractive than a loan, and a loan where you finance a more or less non resell resellable good is also then not attractive for fraudsters. Yeah, but but I don't think to answer the question that offering consumer finance is actually. Um, significantly increase the fraud or opening a, a new new world for fraudsters. I think it's just, uh, uh, it has always been like this and therefore we need to take care and make our homework on that. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, dear speakers, we are really at the end of our time. I think that we could talk for another hour about consumer finance, um, but um, we can't. But I would like to thank the audience for tuning in and engaging with our speakers for the excellent questions. And thanks, Ari, Philip, Dennis and Jaco for an excellent conversation and sharing your insights and best practices in how banks and lenders can easily scale their consumer finance programs by using pre-existing merchant integrations. Um, what we will do, we will send all of you a link to the webcast shortly, and we will get back to questions that we did not have time to include in this uh, conversation. For now, I wish you all a very good rest of the day and hope to see you next time. Thank you.